first for just briefly? Yeah, sure. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Allison Spensley. I am a current doctoral student at UAB um, in global health. I'm in the healthcare organization and policy um, department. Um, I've worked in global health practice for 23, 24 years. I got my MPH from UAB 20 years ago in 2001. So that does make me feel a bit dated. Um, and I've worked mainly around Southern and Eastern Africa um, in HIV prevention, care and treatment and maternal and child health. Um, and I'm super excited about hearing the panelists today. Uh, Lisa? Thank you, Alison. And it's great to be here today. Welcome everybody. Um, so I'm Lisa Kimbo and I too, I'm in the I'm a DRPH uh, student in the HCOP, Healthcare Organization and Policy Track, together with Alison. Um, and it sounds like Alison and I might have worked for a similar amount of time. Um, but uh, I actually started out um, my healthcare practice coming into this from business, you know, from a business uh, angle. And I studied. Um, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for my health systems and management, um, health systems management degree several years ago and uh, only recently chose to come back into DRPH. So I have worked in primary healthcare delivery, uh, various systems, and also in management of uh, health programs, mostly in East Africa and at the Africa continent level with organizations such as IPASS um, out of North Carolina, um, a USAID funded group called AAED that um, was based out of Washington uh, DC and also local organizations in Kenya. I look forward to chatting with you more as we go on with the webinar today. Great, thanks Lisa. Um, so I'm gonna, moderate kind of the first part of today and then Lisa's going to take over. Um, so just to make sure that everyone's clear on the purpose of today's panel, um, the we really wanted to give current global health students a chance to hear about um, breaking into a global health practice career. Um, it can seem really daunting and intimidating when you are thinking about finishing school and you know, looking for that next step, your first job. And so I think today's panel really represent a broad perspective in terms of um, their experiences and the roles that they have. Um, so we wanted to just have some discussion to give everyone an idea of the different ways that, um, that you can go about it. So the outline for today, um, I'm going to introduce each of the panelists very briefly and we've asked them to prepare a couple of slides um, to give everybody an, an additional idea of who they are and, and what they're doing. Um, and then we're going to start a question and answer um, session. We have a couple of questions that um, we've asked them to, to think about and um, as Katie said, please enter any questions um, into the Q&A function and we will hopefully um, have time to get to them. So um, without further ado, let me start um, with Aaron. I think Aaron, is that right, Sam? Aaron's the first. first. Okay, great. Yes. Okay, perfect. So thanks, um, Aaron, for joining us. Um, Aaron Palomares serves as the Deputy Director of the Global Hand Washing Partnership, which is a public-private partnership for hand hygiene programming with a secretariat that's housed at FHI 360, which is in Washington, DC. So in this role, she heads the partnership's strategy and programmatic efforts. And she also provides technical support for the broader WASH division at FHI 360. Um, prior to her current role, she held positions at the United Nations Foundation and also at UAB. And she was an MPH fast track student in the healthcare organization and policy at UAB. So, Erin, I'll turn it over to you for a couple of minutes. Yeah, thanks, Allison. Yeah, so I guess I'll just go uh, a little bit more in detail about myself. So, as Allison mentioned, my name is Erin Palomares. 
Some fun facts about me, I'm, I'm a, a long-standing global health and social justice advocate. Beyond my work, I, I also volunteer with several organizations. I'm also a devoted public transportation user. As someone who lives in DC, our metro system, metro and bus system is really great. So uh, with COVID-19, I've switched to walking because we're only about a seven mile radius, so it's not too difficult. And then I'm also a wannabe hiker. I mean, that's all I have to say about that. I'm originally from Peachtree City, Georgia. Um, we're actually known for our golf carts. We have a really expansive golf cart system in my hometown. And so uh, as one of my favorite high school experiences, I actually drove a golf cart to my high school. And as Allison mentioned, I'm currently based in Washington, DC, and I work for FHI 360, which was previously AED, Lisa. Um, AED merged with FHI, and I'll go into that a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail. And then in terms of my global health interests, you know, really it's maternal and child health, neglected tropical disease, diseases and WASH. Um, and then I also wanted to mention my interest in terms of skill set as well, because this is where I think there's been a pattern within my career. And we'll go into this a little bit more. I think the my interests and topics have changed, but the skill sets that I am continually interested in are uh, advocacy, policy, behavioral research, and integrated programming. And next slide. So just a little bit about my education. I was an MPH fast track student. So I got both of my degrees in 2016. I am public health all the way. So I got my bachelor's degree in public health, global health concentration. I also did my MPH in healthcare organization and policy and I got the global health certificate as well. Uh, when I was developing this, you know, these slides I was trying to look around to see if I could find some old photos. So I got a photo from my graduation and then the bottom right photo is actually a photo from the Sparkman Center Global Health Case Competition, which I competed in and then I also wrote one the next year. So um, just another tidbit there. And the next slide. And so then a little bit more about my work. I currently work at FHI 360, which is an international non-governmental organization working to improve lives through locally driven solutions. We work in over 70 countries. Um, and our headquarters are based in Durham, North Carolina. We also have a, a large office in Washington, DC. It's somewhat considered our co-headquarters. We have about 1500 employees in our office in DC, again, pre-COVID. Um, and I just wanted to break down the structure of FHI 360 because uh, these large international non-governmental organizations are quite big and so it can be quite daunting. There's a very confusing matrix. Um, and on top of that, to add to the confusion, I wear two separate hats, one as the deputy director of the Global Hand Washing Partnership, and then one as program support for the broader WASH division. So I do work for the WASH division at FHI, which is housed under the Maternal and Child Health and Nutrition Department, which is also housed under the Global Health Population and Nutrition Business Unit. Um, those are all fancy terms of just organizational flow. And through my role within the broader WASH division, I support business development activities. Um, I serve as a subject matter expert, particularly on hand hygiene, advocacy and knowledge management, uh, as well as WASH integration. And then I also provide program and administrative support. So just support on contracts, the budget, recruitment of positions, et cetera. And then my main role at FHI 360 is leading the Global Hand Washing Partnership. So, I lead the strategy and thought leadership of the GHP Secretariat, and we have a network of over 30 members. So, um, you know, we we work across um, across different organizations, um, and so really, I'm just managing all of those partners. I also represent the coalition at high level events and conferences, um, and do a lot of the day to day operations as well. So that's just a little bit about me, and I believe that is the end of my slides. Great, thanks so much, Erin. Um, next, we have Elaine McLaughlin. Um, and Elaine is currently working in Honduras with the World Bank Health Team um, as a communications and operations consultant, where she's helping to prepare a 20 million US dollar COVID-19 vaccines procurement and distribution project. That's a mouthful. Um, prior to her current role, Elaine held positions at the United Nations Population Fund in Honduras, as well as with Development Alternatives International. 
Um, Elaine is from Birmingham originally, and she completed her MPH from Nepal while she was interning with a sexual and reproductive health nonprofit. And she began her public health career in 2016 in the Dominican Republic, where she worked for two regional nonprofits that focused on HIV prevention and education. So Elaine, would you like to take it away? Sure, thank you, Allison, and hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you all. Um, so my name's Elaine McLaughlin. I'm a Birmingham native. And my when I started the MPH, I was mainly interested and continue to be interested in maternal and child health, sexual and reproductive health access, education and advocacy. And most recently with some of my work with the Development Alternatives International, I continue to consult for them. And that's a US aid uh, subcontractor executing a school-based violence prevention project in Honduras. So I've gotten more interested in, in violence prevention over the years. Um, I'm also a yoga teacher and student. And so I like to incorporate you know, meditation and mindfulness practices into my work in these larger international organizations as much as I can. Um, a little bit about my education. So I did my MPH at UAB and I have a bachelor's in Spanish language and literature from many moons ago in, from Pomona College in California. And I knew going into the masters that I wanted to focus in all things global health and, and women's and young adolescent girls advancement, sexual and reproductive health access. And so from the get-go, the Sparkman Center was a great resource for me. Um, specifically, I began, I just knocked on doors of, of different professors, including Budwani, Dr. Turan. Um, and I just encourage the listeners today to continue to access the Sparkman Center for all of the opportunities that it provides. Um, during my time at UAB, I participated in the CFAT course. I did a Jamaica infectious diseases course as well during an internship that I did with an HIV prevention nonprofit in, in Kingston. Uh, while I was in Nepal, I was doing a cancer research experiences fellowship uh, with Dr. Shrestha. And that was in the summer of 2015, right after the earthquake. So it became less focused on cervical cancer research and more focused on menstrual hygiene management in a post-disaster context, which was super interesting for me. Um, and I also, while I was in Birmingham, did a little bit of assisting with research activities for Dr. Turan. So that was my experience at school at UAB. Um, and then currently I work as an operations communications and health consultant for the World Bank country office in Honduras. I help coordinate a COVID-19 vaccines acceptance survey uh, so that with the Ministry of Health, we can tailor messages to public health communications strategies um, before rollout of the vaccine. And that's part of the, the preparation of the $20 million vaccines procurement and distribution project, um, which is actually an additional financing to an original $20 million project that was just COVID emergency response, which is currently under execution. Um, in addition to that, I have a much more part-time consultancy doing mostly now writing um, activities for this USAID funded school-based violence prevention project. And that's with the company called Development Alternatives International, which is based in D the DC area. Um, and I, you know, like Aaron said, I feel like I wear a lot of different hats, especially being a consultant. Um, we can go more into the pros and cons of that if people have questions. Um, and yeah, I'm just happy to be here. And I, I feel like I've had a somewhat um, unconventional path and probably will continue to. Um, so I just want to offer support and encouragement to anyone who feels um, perhaps less conventional, less strictly academic um, in, their, in their approach. So thank you so much. 
Great, thanks so much, Elaine. Um, and then finally, we have Kane. And Kane, I'm going to ask you to help me with pronouncing your last name. Is it Agon? It's Agon. Agon. Okay, great. Um, so Kane is currently working for the United States Centers for Disease Control, and he's stationed at the Guam Department of Public Health and Social Services Tuberculosis and Hansen's Disease Control Program. So he is involved in a spectrum of TB control activities that include direct obser observe therapy, contact investigation, surveillance, TB education, and cluster mapping. So he has been locally deployed for the last year for the COVID-19 pandemic, and he currently works in Guam's government quarantine facility for travelers. So while at UAB, um, Kane was a Sparkman Fellow. He competed in several of the global health case competitions, and he was a student in the two-week CFAT field course. So Kane, can I ask you to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Absolutely, and thank you. So uh, like was said, I'm from the 2019 class. Uh, and started working for the CDC a little bit later that year in um, October of 2019. Uh, got a little bit, about three months of experience before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And most of the uh, island where I work, uh, most of the resources for those who work in, in infectious diseases, especially respiratory infectious diseases, uh, were deployed to work for COVID-19. So that's where I've got most of my experience throughout this process. Um, I work for the CDC as a public health associate. Uh, that is a part of their pathways program, which looks for uh, folks who are, have recently graduated from a degree um, to work at kind of an entry level in the uh, federal government and an agency and then follow a uh, career path. So it is specifically an entry level program. Um, I'm hoping that I can answer any questions about that because I went straight from uh, getting my bachelor's to going into the career field. Um, so not something that is, is super standard and um, I hope is a path some people uh, who are listening are considering taking. Um, I'm from Birmingham as well. Uh, grew up a few blocks from campus, um, funny as it is. And uh, my global health interests are primarily in climate health and climate justice. Uh, environmental justice was one of the uh, classes that I TA'd while at UAB and one of uh, my primary areas of interest. I'm also uh, interested in health decision-making, especially now in infectious diseases. And then the links between uh, conflict, specifically um, things like civil unrest, uh, civil violence and inter-country conflict and health. Um, I was also a uh, fairly straightforward public health at UAB. Um, I got my Bachelor of Science in Public Health and concentrated in the Environmental Health Sciences track. My minor was in Peace, Justice, and Ecology, which is an interdisciplinary minor hosted in the Anthropology Department. And the Anthropology Department is uh, what did, where I did most of my research as well. Um, I really started thinking about global health seriously when I did the CFAT day course in my sophomore year and it really just grew as a kernel since then. That was the same year that I switched my major to public health. So it has been a growing interest and I hope it remains a lifelong interest. And then currently, uh, like I said, I'm working for uh, the US CDC as a public health associate. My original area was uh, tuberculosis control I've diverged a little bit from that, um, but it's still something that I'm going back to and I'm uh, doing ongoing projects for still working on cases and uh, genotype mapping for the department currently. Um, Guam has had a little bit of a unique approach to COVID-19, which has required a lot of hands on deck um, in order to try and control the virus in a unique environment. And uh, I've been locally deployed in some capacity as a contact tracer and now a data manager since March of 2020. Great, thanks so much, Kane. Um, all right, well, clearly from everybody's introduction, this is an incredible panel and um, really different in terms of 
current work roles and background and interests and um, focus areas. So I'm excited to get some different perspectives from some of the questions that we, that come up. So I'm going to throw out the first question. Um, and again, um, for, for all the attendees, as you have questions, please feel free to um, type them into the Q&A box and we'll be um, looking at them as, as we continue the discussion. Um, and so I'm just going to throw this open for, for all three of you. Um, I'm interested in how your current um, area of interest or work compares to what it was when you were in school. Um, if it is very similar, it's always been the same, or if you're currently working in a totally different area than you were in school. And I think it's interesting, you know, Kane, you're, I think, the most recent graduate, so you're, you know, the most close with, with UAB, um, but Elaine and Aaron, Aaron have been out for a couple of years, so just to see how things have, have shifted. Um, so does somebody want to jump in and start us off? or I'm gonna call on somebody. <laughs> I can start off because I, it's interesting because I was not interested in WASH at all, or at the very least, I didn't have any experience in it while I was going through both you know, my bachelor's and master's programs. Um, I would say, again, topically my interests have changed because when I was in school, my interests reflected the experiences I had. So much like Elaine, I did do a lot of international internships as a student. I interned in Jamaica, I interned in South Africa, all of which had an HIV focus. Um, and by all means, I'm still very much interested in that topic area. Um, and in fact, when I was working with the United Nations Foundation, part of my work was working with the Global Fund, so HIV, TB, and malaria. Um, but certainly, I have realized through, you know, I've been with FHI 360 for a couple of years, my interests have really changed in that I, I will always love whatever topic or subject area I'm working in. Because the more you get to know an area, the more you become familiar with it, the more that you know the ins and outs. What I think hasn't changed for me are the, the competencies. So like advocacy and policy is my niche. Um, and you know, I got my MPH in healthcare organization and policy. I really enjoy knowledge management. I enjoy strategic thinking. Um, and so things like that ne haven't necessarily changed, but in terms of, um, I guess just my, my topical interests, it, I think it'll, I think it'll always change. I, I mean, I think at some point I'll probably want to niche down into my career, especially as I continue working in program implementation. It just makes a lot more sense because you're more familiar with the, the different actors. But um, certainly I think it's important for students who are listening in now who might have a particular interest just to be open-minded in, in terms of their job search because you never know what else is out there. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Um, Elaine or Kane? Sure. Um, I'll say that I knew that I was very interested in, and I continue to be interested in sexual health advocacy and education. Um, however, as I started working, um, it, when I was in the Dominican Republic, I worked for a nonprofit that also housed an HIV clinic in the bottom floor of its building. And so the Sparkman Center actually sent down motivational interviewing trainers to train some of the healthcare providers. Um, motivational interviewing is a behavior change practice that centers the patient or the client's autonomy and motivation for embracing a given behavior change, such as drug abstention, or in this case, antiretroviral medication adherence. And so I translated all the materials for that training and then got to participate as like a um, assistant um, interpreter, but I was also, you know, actively in the training. And ever since then, I've just become more and more interested in this idea of behavior change and motivational interviewing in particular. Um, that hasn't translated too directly into much else of, of what I've done, except for like a, at the broader sense in behavior change communications, which I've sort of learned as I've gone. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, you know, there's always room for whatever you're faced with to affect and, and you know, kind of direct your, your interests, or at least that's been my experience. So um, 
I'm sure that I will continue to shift as I as I move forward. Thanks so much. Um, Kane, jump in. So I, I would say that my current topic area of infectious diseases, uh, specifically infectious respiratory diseases, um, as well as just the current skill set that I use on a daily basis, uh, which involves a lot of data management, a lot of um, making sure that programs are running uh, efficiently and effectively, and then doing things like uh, managing data sets to specifically retroactively look at things like uh, point in time and, and source uh, tracing TB infections back to a specific cluster if I can. Um, all of those things are things that I never thought I would be doing when I was uh, studying at UAB, specifically concentrating in environmental health. Um, this position has taken me on a, a fairly different track in, in a lot of ways, um, but I would absolutely agree with uh, Aaron and Elaine. Um, I, I think that you end up wearing a lot of hats no matter where you end up in global health. I think it's kind of, it's, it's kind of the name of the game. And um, I would absolutely encourage everybody to stay open and be open to adding to your skill sets. Um, because even though I never specifically wanted to do infectious diseases or data management, those are now two new things that I have experiences in. And even if I end up diverting back to environmental health, um, which I do intend to, and to uh, community engagement, which is a really big part of my work that I've had the opportunity through this position to grow, um, all of those skills are transferable. And you really just have to keep in mind for where can your areas of interest align with the work you're doing, even if it doesn't match 100%. So I've always tried to focus on in my work, um, building my community engagement skills and working in patient one on one interactions, which is something that there's a big opportunity to do in TB because we're in contact with patients and communities um, over such a long term of treatment. Um, so that's something that I hope to apply to environmental health later. And it's definitely a skill that I would not have if I hadn't been in TB. And um, I don't know if uh, Aaron, Elaine, or any of uh, our other uh, panelists and moderators would agree, but um, data management, systems management, and knowing how to work many different systems, draw things is, um, and uh, troubleshoot when systems crash, multiple systems crash. Uh, these, are, these are all really useful skills. Um, and it's those things that you don't necessarily think about when you're at the bachelor's level, but they're definitely things that you need to grow and something that I didn't expect to, but I've definitely grown through this experience. Thanks, I completely agree with you, King. <laughs> I second everything that you said. Um, Okay, um, if I could, uh, I, think, I think your experiences are just um, wonderful and, and I'm glad to see as the panel and we're discussing that it's, um, it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's a pretty diverse uh, kind of, um, just between the three of you, your tracks are very different. I know that a lot of the people who are listening in today might be coming up to graduation or you know, looking at really transitioning from school to work. And you recall, you know, you you were there at some point, and and um, so we'd really be interested to hear from all of you about how you managed that transition from school to to work, and what what would you say were some of the biggest challenges that that you faced in that process? Whoever wants to go first. I don't always want to go first, but I always, I always want you to go first, Aaron. So please. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's interesting because I, I was a fast track student as well. So it, my perspective is a little bit different because I, um, I didn't really have the opportunity to gain experience prior to my master's degrees. And so all my interests were based off of what I already knew as an undergraduate. Um, but, you know, I would say one of the biggest challenges for me is just switching from that student perspective to um, an actual public health practitioner. You know, when you're out in the field, it, there's no rubric. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that just, you'll have to understand that it, it's okay to be out of your comfort zone. Much of the job, and Payne and Elaine have alluded to this, will be learning on the job. So the public health curriculum 
um, provide you with these concepts and theories uh, that you can use. Um, you know, you can use that knowledge in whatever you do, but then once you get out into the field, of course, that's where you apply it. And so I think that there's always going to be some sort of learning curve simply because it's, it's a switch of mindset. Um, and in terms of how I just transitioned over, you know, I think, and I think we'll probably get into this a little bit more too, but just, it's so important to utilize the resources that are, are given to you. So the Sparkman Center is a really great resource. Um, I would definitely encourage you to find faculty mentors. Um, that was another big thing for me and just in terms of my transition um, and, and even helping me find you know, the positions that I ended up having right when I graduated. So certainly relationship building is very important as a student and it's something that's not always thought about. Um, so I, I definitely encourage you to reach out and um, and just explore your interests and, and utilize the resources that UAB gives you. Thank you. Thank you. I would agree with Erin with everything that she said. Um, I would say one of the challenges that I've faced since leaving the cocoon of the master's and academic environment is struggling a little bit with imposter syndrome. Um, I feel like as a student, I was so confident to knock on professors' doors and email people that inspired me. And, you know, there's just this wealth of resources. And then coming into the professional world and, and feeling a little bit like, oh, wait, like, what am I doing here exactly? And um, and so just working with that, you know, and, and learning on, on the job and also learning to advocate for myself in a professional environment. Um, I did have a somewhat toxic work experience at the UN. It's not to say that all UN agency professional experiences are that way, but um, my particular experience was um, pretty disheartening. And so, I had always dreamed about working at the UN and then I finally realized like this is affecting my mental health and my experience of my day-to-day -day life and that there are other ways to contribute to public health and human rights um, that don't have to be through, through this vehicle. And so I would just encourage you to really um, keep, keep your sense of self about you and, and um, just yeah, maintain maintain your self respect in in these working environments while also keeping a beginner's mind, you know, and and going into things with probably more questions than answers. Um, so that's that's my perspective. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. Kane, anything to add? Absolutely, I, I agree with Aaron and Elaine. Um, to to a certain extent, it's um, I think it's a challenge coming into any new position in global health, especially coming out of academia. It's um, or or being fresh off of a degree. Um, actually, being able to prepare is is not always realistic. Um, you can do the best that you can, um, but there is nothing that can prepare you in I would say most situations for the actuality of what your work is going to be like in the field. Um, you'll encounter situations that there are no easy answers for. Sometimes there are very limited good answers for um, that you have to get really creative to find. Um, but to keep an open mind to ask questions and to be honest about your experiences, what you uh, feel like you're uncertain of and to look for those answers from your supervisors, your mentors, the people who are experts at your disposal in your department. Um, it's not always as easy as it is at university, um, but just making sure that you are keeping an open mind, that you're continuing to push yourself and don't be daunted by the idea of the experience. Um, that's something that I think uh, especially if you're considering going in straight out of um, straight out of college, uh, I would definitely you, you do have to take it seriously because it can involve uh, very large moves, very big cultural changes. Um, these are all things to be mindful of, but to not let that be um, a limiting factor. And I, I would absolutely agree uh, agree with Elaine um, about you know, managing the things that you know about yourself, imposter syndrome is, is absolutely something that I struggled with too. I, um, 
was assigned to Guam with two other associates from the CDC. Um, I looked up their LinkedIn profiles. They had all had internships all across the world. Um, and I had never uh, left the United States until I took a plane and had a layover in Tokyo before I came to Guam. That was the first time I had ever left. And I wow. thought, you know, at that point, I was like, what am I doing here? Uh, am, I, am I actually prepared for this? Um, everybody has different skill sets. And I definitely have been able to do things that my colleagues haven't been able to do and vice versa. Public health is a cooperative and it's important to be mindful of your skills and where you need to grow, um, but to not let others, the skills of other people that you're working with um, be a barrier to you mentally when you're trying to acclimate to a new environment. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, that's really great. Um, and in fact, Kane, you've touched on one of the questions I can see, Agatha is asking, does working with global health involve traveling globally to different parts of the country, of the world? Yes. And then um, maybe we'll stick with you, Kane, because she's also asking, you know, what is your advice to someone who would want to work at the CDC after graduation? Yeah, with our prior experience. So I think this people will be interested in knowing how, how does one you know, submit applications, what does the interview process uh, look like? And yeah, uh, interesting that you had not traveled outside of the US before traveling all the way to, to Guam. So just talk to us a little bit more about that experience. Absolutely, and um, Guam, Guam is of course a, a US territory, very different um, as, a, as a cultural environment than the mainland mm -hmm. United States and presents uh, very different health challenges. Um, but I, I say uh, that to say that I, I often let myself be daunted when I was applying for things because I uh, didn't have on the ground global health experience. Um, I had, you know, many diverse academic experiences, um, but nothing that was practical and hands on that involved patient care. All these things that I do now were not skill sets that I had developed um, when I was at university. So on the job learning is, I would say, a staple of most global health positions that people will take up for the first time. Um, later in career, of course, uh, you need to maintain certain skill sets and you may be working in different places. But in general, I think most people are very flexible who work in global health and are very willing to help people learn on the job and build the experiences uh, as long as they show the initiative, the responsibility, um, all the things that you will learn how to do from your classes and just maintaining that kind of ethic of practicing global health properly and in good faith. Um, and in terms of uh, getting started with physicians, um, it, I, it's, it's a little funny. I, I get the question of how, how do I get a job at the CDC a lot? Um, I, I want everyone to know that how I found out about this opening at the CDC was I opened the Get a Handle newsletter one day and it was their entry level position at the CDC looking for recent graduates. Um, use, use all of the resources at, uh, at your command. The School of Public Health in particular, I think, is so great about bringing students different opportunities that come up um, and I have to say within, you know, a few hours of sending an interest email to the um, person that was the contact for that ad in the uh, newsletter, I was connected to an alumni that I already had experiences with. I was talking with her about the position um, and it was, it was a really great experience and the connections are absolutely there. Um, definitely ask your professors, use the Sparkman Center, keep your eyes open, and don't be afraid to apply for things. And um, of course, if anybody uh, wants to contact me personally, I, I think more in-depth uh, conversations, um, I'm absolutely willing to have those. Uh, the Alumni Network has been so uh, helpful for me in, in this uh, position and, and in global health in general. And um, absolutely stay connected, um, stay connected to people. And global health is all about relationships, maintain all the relationships that you have and grow them, especially while you're at UAB. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Um, and I, I think that will resonate with a lot of the other questions that are coming up. But uh, Elaine, do you want to add anything in terms of international experience and um, that transition? Is sure. There... Um, let's see. I... I knew that I, it was a big priority for me to live abroad. And um, I was a Spanish major in undergrad and I've just always enjoyed being in a different language and in a different different cultures. Um, so that was something that I really tried to prioritize as I was going through the process. Um, let's see, I think that if that's a priority to you, I know the Peace Corps program is fairly popular and could be, it's obviously a, a fairly large time commitment. Um, and then what the way that I got into the UN agency in Honduras was through the UN Volunteers Program, which oddly enough is paid. So I'm not really sure why they call it volunteers, <laughs> but, um, but it's certainly not, you know, compensated as generously as UN staff positions. Um, so be forewarned on that. But that is, uh, you can you can create a profile on UN volunteers and and search for jobs directly. It used to be that they would review your profile and contact you if you fit their what they were looking for. Um, but that has since changed, and so I'm pretty sure you can directly apply um, to positions there, which they they yeah they have a, a ton of options and i believe they even have some that are national un volunteers and international and then like based on your age range so if you're still in your bachelor's um there there could be opportunities there as well great great thank you um i see another question here from um uh, Sean McMahon that says, uh, and I'll, maybe I'll pose this to Aaron. What sort of experiences do you wish you had had as part of your education at the School of Public Health? In other words, what should centers or institutes start offering to better prepare future graduates? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I will say, I think I was very ambitious as a student because I pretty much made my, I forced myself into all of the clubs and like all of the different courses and everything like that. I did multiple internships. So um, again, encouraging students to use those resources. But something that I, I almost wish had more focus was this focus on international non-governmental organizations. So I mentioned earlier on that my interests have really shifted. And so when I originally left UAB, I thought I was going to, similar to Elaine, I thought I was going to be working for this large multilateral organization within the UN system or with CDC um, or you know, maybe even with a public health department. And so there are a lot of courses that focus on those uh, specifically, but there's this huge sector um, or this huge industry within international development of these INGOs who essentially implement these programs from USAID and these large funders like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and, and I just, at least in my personal experience, there wasn't as much, um, there weren't as many events focused on the perspectives of, um, you know, staff members who worked at those types of organizations. And so I just didn't really, need, like, I didn't really know that, the, that this was even in existence until I just so happened to stumble upon it. Actually, while I was in Jamaica, I met someone who was working at RTI International, who, which is another INGO. And that's what sort of got me into this world. But had I not had that interaction, I would have been completely, um, yeah, just ignorant of, of knowing that this, this entire space existed. Okay. And, and for you, Erin, how did you find your particular job? How did you do your search, your global health job search? All through networking. Um, so I, you know, I, I got my first couple of positions through um, some UAB mentors. Um, when I worked for the UN Foundation, I was actually also a volunteer for them first. And so then when um, I was a consultant for them, an advocacy consultant, and so when something came up, I applied for it for that. Um, and then with FHI 360, I had a couple of connections. I've always, one of, one of my big, big goals after graduation was to move up to DC. And so 
Um, you know, I, I did several fellowships both during and after my, my, um, my degrees. And so I had a lot of connections in Washington DC already that helped me when I was applying to these positions. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, maybe um, to any of the three of you, uh, there's a question that says, to what extent you get to interact individually with the populations that are affected by your work? So directly with, you know, with the individuals. Um, and there's a, a, a sort of a similar question where um, Jacqueline wants to know what it looks like in the non-clinical field for each of you and your participation in universal, I think it's universal health coverage. It says universal coverage. So maybe you could just combine all of you, the three of you to just talk about how, how much your work, you know, really ends up, you know, how, to what extent you end up working with the populations of, of concern. Uh, maybe Elaine, start. Sure, that's a great question and something that's always been sort of top of mind for me in that I love working with people and interacting directly with beneficiaries has always been a big motivator for me. And I'd say that it does vary. Um, as I've moved up into larger international organizations, Unfortunately, my interaction with beneficiaries has decreased. Um, when I worked in the Dominican Republic, I was on a research team with transgender sex workers in a bus going around the country doing behavioral surveys and um, really interacting with our, our target populations. Um, and then I, I was also in an organization where there was almost no room to move up and further develop my career. And so um, when I had the opportunity to transition to the UN and then the World Bank, I jumped at those chances. And in communications roles, I do, I did have some interactions with, like I would do focus groups with school, school aged children for the violence prevention project and work um, in a limited way with, with beneficiaries. But I, I do think, at least in my personal experience, as I've moved into these larger international organizations, um, the program implementation work has, has brought me to more of an office-based role in which I'm hearing about stories from the field. And, um, and so, yeah, I would say that that's a trade-off that I'm still grappling with and, um, you know, to be continued, but that's, that's my honest answer. Great, great, awesome. Okay. I, I, I really agree with um, Elaine and, and share kind of a similar experience, even just in the um, year and a half that I've been uh, involved in the first couple of days, um, weeks and months of being in the TB program, it was direct patient interaction, administering direct observed therapy. And one of the great things about the program that I worked in was uh, having inroads in the community. We would meet people um, in the parking lot of their job site, in their front yard, um, whatever it took to uh, get them appropriate care, switching things. That kind of patient interaction um, was fantastic. Um, it, it was really great to do. And I got to do some of that as it moved into contact investigation. Um, sometimes you do have to uh, do things like home evaluations, um, seeing the points of potential infection um, in a safe way and, and get to know people and have in-person conversations. Um, I will say COVID-19 changed a lot of that. Um, but even still, uh, I I agree with Elaine. I think as you get a little bit deeper in and take on more programmatic roles, which is kind of the, um, I would say the normal path that most people follow, uh, especially in term limited positions, uh, like the one that mine is, it gets more computer based, it gets more office based as you go on and, and it becomes a little bit more about systems and partners. Um, and it takes a little bit away from the direct uh, patient or direct uh, beneficiary interaction. Um, it's, it's definitely something that I miss a lot, but uh, it's, it is something wonderful. And I think anytime that 
you know, you have the opportunity to do that, you want to take it, of course. Um, most places in global health can be a little bit flexible. Um, and then, of course, just taking the opportunities as they come. But um, one thing that I would encourage people to um, to do and just something that I've been thinking about recently is to always remember that um, regardless of whether you're working directly with uh, patients, clients, beneficiaries uh, in a daily role to always remember that those same people are at the end of whatever project you're working on. Um, any you know grant funding, surveillance program improvement, all of those have people at the end of it because it's global health. So it, it is a harder thing to keep in mind when you're not right there, but um, it, it is uh, all the work is important, definitely. Just to add, I, I do work at the headquarters level. Um, and so, of course, I'm not always out in the field. That being said, we, of course, pre-COVID, we did have co-creation workshops in country where we did gather, you know, FHI 360 has a systems approach called whole systems room, where we had these workshops to in, in, engage all of the actors in the system um, to come up with uh, these solutions and ideas. Um, but I would also say just generally, I, I agree with Elaine and Kane um, and that it, it really depends on the role that you do. Typically within an international non-governmental organization, the, the implementers will be nationals. Um, you know, as, as someone on the headquarters side, when we're recruiting for like a chief of party position for a, a specific like five-year program, for instance, we're looking for people already in the country. Um, simply because we wanna engage the community, they already understand the cultural norms and social norms. That's not to say that you won't, you know, like there's no opportunity for you to live abroad because that's still very much the case. But just thinking from like a recruitment perspective, um, typically those on the ground are, are people from, from that area in that region. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, uh Kane, very quickly, uh, before we wrap up, um, Dr. Turan had a question about your working in a COVID quarantine facility in Guam. Is that what you're, what you're doing? What is that? Yes. Uh, so Guam has taken an uh, approach to COVID-19 for travelers that is a little bit more commonly seen in um, East Asia and in the Western Pacific region. Um, but is not so familiar in the United States uh, mainland response to COVID-19. Um, so you may have heard about quarantine facilities in places like Australia, Japan, South Korea, for those who have recently traveled into the country. Um, it, it's similar to that in that if you travel into Guam uh, by air, by sea, um, unless there is a specific uh, pre-approved reason um, and you have things like a valid COVID-19 test result. Uh, for example, if you're a critical services worker that's coming in, a medical provider, somebody that's coming to the island for medical treatment. Um, in those cases, we allow people to enact a kind of modified quarantine um, in their home or a rented lodging location. Um, but otherwise, if you are just traveling to the island in general, the default is that uh, you will undertake a quarantine in a government run for um, up to 14 days. Uh, there are mm -hmm. different options if you'd like to um, test and then continue your quarantine at home if your test is negative or mm -hmm. um, after a certain amount of time being asymptomatic. Um, there are different options for that, but in as a standard, Guam has uh, enacted a traveler quarantine of 14 days for those who arrive on island. And so the facility uh, where I work in data management is uh, the place that houses all the folks who have recently traveled to Guam. Interesting. Okay, we're coming up to the top of the hour. I'd just like to give all of you maybe in just a minute, just um, your last, your final thought, you know, just your last recommendation or advice, what comes to mind um, for those who might be listening. Um, we'll start with Erin and uh, then Elaine and then Kate. Um, I think the theme of this panel is really utilizing your, your resources and your networks. I think beyond everything else that we've said, because again, everyone's experience will be different as they go into the global health workforce. Um, that network is your strongest tool. And so I would suggest, I'm just gonna name a couple of specific ones. Of course, all of UAB's resources, 
There's also Global Health Council has a really great job board and they have a really great team behind them. CUGH, Consortium of Universities for Global Health, the core group uh, based in DC, APHA. Uh, these are all networks that you can get involved in as a student. And I highly encourage you to do that because the more that you can build your network now, the easier it will be to find someone who's working in a position that you're wanting to do in the future. And if you already have that connection, then it's just a lot easier to start that conversation and understand a little bit more about what, you, what they, they do and, and what that position requires. Wonderful, excellent advice. Thank you, Erin. Elaine? Well, I would echo Erin and say that, you know, you never know what, in terms of networking, you never know if it's the conversation that you have with that first contact that you think is going to be your go-to person or people that they might be able to introduce you to. So maybe that's super self-evident, but it just, you know, I've had experiences where I just happen to have a friend who knows someone at the World Bank who is hiring bilingual communications consultant. And that was literally how I heard about the opportunity and um, got an interview. And so it's just to trust that, or even like go on blind faith that, um, you know, reaching out to different contacts and definitely nurturing your networks. Um, it might not be the conversation that you think that initial conversation, but having the conversation is always worth it because they could, you know, it could spark ideas in that person's mind of future opportunities to, to connect you to. Wonderful. Kane, any last thoughts? Absolutely agree with Aaron and Elaine. Um, relationships are, if I had to say one thing was the most important thing in public health, global health, and your own professional career, it, it has to be relationships. It, it comes down to that. Um, build them, maintain them authentically, and uh, make them wherever you can and wherever you go. Uh, use your network, of course. And also keep yourself open, be flexible. Um, if you want to do global health, it, it may be um, a compromise of location or uh, skills or subject area, but always be open um, and know that you can grow wherever you end up landing, even if it's, if it's not exactly the place that you uh, think and all experiences are valid and useful when it comes to uh, building yourself up as a professional in global health. So. Uh, stay aware and always learn from the experiences you have. Wow, thank you so much. I think we can see a lot of comments have come in. You may not be able to see them right now, but there's a lot of appreciation. People say great advice, great information. Thank you so much to all of you for sharing such valuable tips. There was one comment, I think, Samantha, you wanted to comment on the um, people are asking about if they can follow up or they may have some other questions. Do you want to say anything, Samantha? Maybe she. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button. <laughs> um, so Rebecca had a question about if the panelists would be willing to share their contact information in case there um, are more questions um, that people have uh, to be able to speak more in depth about some of their experiences. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. Um, you know, I think that this is like one step, uh, one step in your, your networking process, right? So utilizing us as your network moving forward, we're always happy, or I, I guess I can only speak to myself, but I'm always happy to um, be that resource and, and be that connection, uh, especially again with the INGO world, because I know that that's something that uh, might be new to, to many of you. Great. Um... Yes, Elaine? Yeah, I second Erin and um, I'm happy to, to be in contact. So feel free to share my information. And also I just wanna say I'm so inspired by Erin and Kane's um, trajectories. So it's been really cool to participate. Same here, please feel free to reach out and um, uh, to anybody that I can, Katie, Samantha, I guess uh, y'all would be the easiest points of contact, but please feel free to share my contact information for anybody that's interested in follow-up. Um, and thank you, Aaron, Elaine, and everybody who uh, was here. I'm excited to speak to some folks from UAB again, and thank you all for sharing your experiences. Awesome, and thank you very much uh, to my fellow 
moderator, Alison, for kicking us off. Uh, Katie, did you want to say something as we come to a close? Thank you very much to everybody for um, joining in and being participating. You've done a great job. Thank you. Okay, all the best.